We'll be in Revelation chapter 1, and our focus today is on verses 9 through 20. The glorious vision of the exalted Son of Man. And if you're physically able, I would invite you to stand in honor to God's word as we read it together. I will read, please follow along, Revelation 1, 9 through 20. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest, the hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I die, behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw on my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. May God add his blessing to this, the reading of his word. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you for your word to us today. We humble ourselves as we hear your voice. We humble ourselves as we hear your voice. God, please speak through the noise. May the good seed of your word find good soil in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please be seated. You ever wonder what Jesus looked like? Has that ever been something that may have come to mind to you? What did Jesus look like? I know I've thought about that before. By the way, can I get one of those bottles of water? That would be awesome. Thank you. I forgot to raise my hand. <laughs> what did Jesus look like? <clears throat> I'm sure if one of the 12 disciples were to visit us today and invite us to ask any question we wish, someone would say something like, Hey, you spent a lot of time with Jesus. We know who he was, what he did, and what he was like, but what did Jesus look like? What do you think people might say? I'm sorry. Handsome? Okay, that's interesting. What do you think people might say? Kind of like the guy in front of me. Kind of like the guy in front of you, okay? All right, I like that. I like that. Anybody else? Long what? hair. Long, long hair. Long hair. What did Jesus look like? One more, Debbie? Ordinary. Just to Ordinary. Yeah. Ordinary. Okay, well, let, let's go over a couple of things and um, hold on while I drink some more water. <laughs> Okay, feeling better now. A couple of things about Jesus and what he may have looked like. First of all, let's be pretty clear here that Jesus wasn't white. All right, blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus, definitely not accurate, okay? So let's be very clear about that. You know, in the Middle Ages, uh, European artwork became very, very prevalent, and Jesus oftentimes was portrayed as a European, white, Caucasian, and all that, okay, so Jesus wasn't white. He was a Jewish man from the Middle East. A Jewish man from the Middle East worked as a carpenter, probably spent a lot of time outside in the sun, so he likely had dark skin, dark eyes, and dark hair. 
One person has said it's Jesus, of Jesus. The Bible doesn't say anything about the color of Jesus' skin, but he was a Jew, an Israelite, a Hebrew. He was of the Semitic descent. His skin color was probably between light olive and medium dark brown. Probably looked like your typical Middle Easterner. So think of somebody from Jordan or Syria or Saudi Arabia and Iraq, and that's probably what Jesus looked like. And some of us maybe aren't comfortable with that. Jesus probably looked more like uh, someone who's very different from us. You see pictures in the news of people from the Middle East, that's what Jesus looked like. Perhaps the idea that Jesus looked much more, says one author, the idea that Jesus looked much more like the members of ISIS or the Taliban we see in the news than the Caucasian actors who typically portray him in American movies can be difficult for many white Americans to accept. So let's be clear about that. Jesus probably didn't have long hair. Sorry about that, brother, but he, he probably didn't have long hair. Jesus was a Nazarene, not a Nazarite. And because of that small little change in words, many artists thought of Jesus as a Nazarite, one who did not cut their hair. But that's not what Scripture says. He was a Nazarene. He was from Nazareth. So he probably didn't have long hair. And sorry, sister, here in the front. Jesus wasn't particularly attractive, at least not in his physical appearance. She thought that Jesus was handsome. Well, the Scripture actually says he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. If you're somebody who's experienced a lot of rejection, you've been despised, you've had people say terrible things about you, acquainted with grief, person of sorrows, you feel like men hide their faces and people esteem you not. But you got a lot in common with Jesus, because that's exactly how Isaiah 53 portrays Jesus. In Isaiah 52, after his crucifixion, we read that his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So, what did Jesus look like? Well, I guess apart from general Middle Eastern physical characteristics, we really can't know until perhaps we see him face to face. But, but in Revelation chapter 1, John the Apostle has a glorious vision of the risen and exalted Son of Man, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, John the Apostle knew Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He spent time with Jesus during his earthly ministry. He witnessed him in his resurrection body. But here in Revelation 1, John sees Jesus in magnificent, resplendent, and dazzling glory. So let's take a look at these verses together in Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. Verse 9. So we read, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So John here introduces himself. And how does he introduce himself? He's our brother in Christ. Our brother in Christ. So we're related to him by the Spirit, John the Apostle. He is the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's how he described himself in the Gospel of John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. At the Last Supper, he was reclining close to Jesus and leaned up against Jesus and said, Is it I, Lord? And Jesus said, No, it's the one who dips the morsel who will betray me. So at the Last Supper, he's sitting right close to Jesus. At the cross, all the other disciples have fled and run away, scared for their lives. Where's John? He's right there with the brave and courageous women at the foot of the cross. And Jesus looks down on him and says, Woman, 
Behold your son to Mary, and to John he says, Son, behold your mother. What a sacred entrustment for Jesus on the cross to have entrusted John with the care of his mother. At the empty tomb, it was John arriving second, but John who saw the empty tomb and believed. Now, there were others, of course, who saw first, but in that sprint with Peter, he <laughs> saw and believed. And John is the longest living of the 12 disciples. The longest living of the 12 disciples. He also describes himself here as our partner. I am your brother and partner. Partner in what? In tribulation. Now, I believe, as we'll see in our study of Revelation, that there is a great tribulation that is yet to come. But Jesus promised us in this world tribulation. He said, take heart, I've overcome the world. But these are times of tribulation that we are going through. Jesus has conquered by means of the cross and his resurrection triumph. He is seated in power and authority at the Father's right hand in heaven. He is coming again. But this is a time of Satan's fury and his last gasp, if you will. Some call it the church age, the age of our witness. Why hasn't Jesus returned yet? Because God is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And so God's patience is seen in his delay. And this is the time of the church's witness. But it's a time of tribulation because the kingdom of evil is pushing back against the kingdom of light. And so what did John experience in his life? He experienced his fair share of persecution. Not only that, which we can read about in the scriptures, but we're told from church tradition that John was opposed by the Roman authorities and the local officials trying to kill him, had him boiled alive in hot oil. And they couldn't kill him. And they tried other things to take his life. And here in Revelation, we see that he was on the island of Patmos. The island of Patmos is about 40 miles off the coast of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. It's a small island. There was a Roman prison colony there, and certainly John was in prison on the island of Patmos. So he experienced his fair share of tribulation. He also says, I'm your partner, not only in tribulation, but in the kingdom. I think he's talking here about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus, the kingdom work, the gospel, the ministry. We're partners. And so while John may now be with the Lord, less than 2,000 years later, we look back, we consider him a brother, a partner in tribulation in the kingdom and in the patient endurance that are in Jesus. That really is the, the big idea of the book of Revelation. What is meant to inspire within each one of us as followers of Jesus is patient endurance. To continue on, to fix our eyes on Jesus and to keep running the race that is before us. And to do so by the power that God provides in the hope that even though things are tough right now, we know that Jesus is going to win, that good is going to win, that rights are going to be wrong, that evil is going to be punished. Many times people say, well, why is it that good people suffer and evil people seem to get all the breaks in life? And that may be kind of how things are right now in this topsy-turvy world, but one day when Jesus returns, everything is going to be set straight and set right upright once again. And so that is our hope that we look forward to. And with the eyes of faith, we look down through the decades, down through the centuries to the future, and the eyes of faith see the future realities of God's victory as so crystal clear and so certain that they are realities we build our lives upon today. The patient endurance that are in Jesus. In Jesus, he says. Do you remember, I'm sure John did, Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. That's what it means to be a follower, to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow. For whoever would save his life will lose it, 
but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. That's what Jesus promised. So John is our brother in Christ. He's our partner. And then we move to verse 10, introducing the vision itself. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. All right, in the spirit. This is what we might describe as one author did as a divinely induced state of the prophet as he received his vision from Jesus. So I don't know if this is that dramatic Hollywood thing where he's like rigid and his eyes fall back into his head or if he's just sitting and meditating and this is happening to him. Uh, but it's on the Lord's day. It's on the Lord's day. So he's in the spirit, this divinely induced state where he's going to see his incredible visions. It's on the Lord's day. Now, what is the Lord's day? Just yell it out. What's the Lord's day? Okay, the first day of the week. All right? That's one option. That's the option that I have always thought that this is talking about the first day of the week. There's another option. The Lord's day could be a reference to the day of the Lord. And so that would mean that in these visions, while he's in the spirit, John is being carried forward to witness the tumultuous events that take place at the day of the Lord, or Christ's return. A third option would be that this means a, a lordly day. I don't like that option so much, a day that's filled with the Lord's presence, though. Uh, and there are some who believe very strongly it's the first day of the week, and others who believe very strongly that John has been carried forward to see the day of the Lord, and that's what he means. He says, as he continues, on the Lord's day, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, like a trumpet. Now, we got some people in our church who speak pretty loud, <laughs> but I don't think, some of you know who I'm talking about, right? There's a few left. But I don't think that it's anything like the voice like a trumpet that John heard as he's having this vision on the Lord's Day. The word trumpet comes up quite a bit in Revelation and in prophetic literature and in all scriptural accounts about the day of the Lord. Trumpet calls were frequently associated with battle, with warning, with the gathering of the elect, the resurrection of the dead, the return of Christ, the day of the Lord. So this voice like a trumpet, and it says, write what you see in a book. So he's going to see incredible, indescribable visions and he's to use the tool of human language and write these visions in a book and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. And God willing, next Sunday we'll begin looking at the letters to the angels of the churches beginning with Ephesus. All right, so that's the introduction to the vision. And then in verse 12, we are introduced to Jesus. Remember, what is this book? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Say that with me. The revelation of Jesus Christ. This book is not meant to settle for us idle curiosities about the future. Now, certainly, it does reveal the future. It's prophetic. And what it says about the future will take place. Amen? Amen? But this book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so when we come to this book, it is Jesus who is revealed to us. It's Jesus that we get to know. Not only Jesus, who came as the suffering servant to die and provide for our salvation, but Jesus who is coming as the conquering king to vanquish evil and to vindicate his people. This is the Jesus that Revelation helps us to know. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so I want to tell you as I speak words of truth to myself that our Jesus and our view of him is not adequate we may view Jesus only as a baby born at Christmas time and laid in a manger. 
Or we may view Jesus only as the, the teacher who's welcoming the children to come unto him. Or maybe we view Jesus only as the, the teacher who is screaming at the scribes and the Pharisees and publicly rebuking them and publicly decrying them and the horrible weights they're putting on people and how they're driving people from the kingdom when he's trying to invite them in. Maybe that's the Jesus that you picture. Or maybe you only picture a Jesus who's on the cross, who's dying to pay the price for our sin. Or maybe you don't like the idea of suffering in the cross, and so you only picture Jesus in his resurrection body, or the exalted Jesus at the Father's right hand. And if we look at this text, we need to get a, a whole and more perfect and complete picture of Jesus, because in this text, we are presented with Jesus in his glory, in his exaltation as the risen conquering, reigning Son of Man. So look at verse 12. It says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. Seven golden lampstands. As we'll see at the end of the chapter, these seven golden lampstands represent seven churches, I believe representative of all local churches, who are supposed to be lights to the world. And in the midst of the lampstand, there's one who is tending to the lamps, tending to the light, tending to the churches, one like a son of man, hearkening back now to Daniel's prophecy of the son of man. It says that this son of man is clothed with a long robe. So Son of Man is the title given to the Messiah who will rule over the nation of the peoples of the earth forever. He will be lifted up on the cross to provide salvation. He will be lifted up in glory and exaltation. One day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So when we speak of the Son of Man, we are speaking of Jesus as the Messiah the long-awaited one of prophecy. He's wearing a long robe, and so his vestments, his clothing, remind us of kingly attire. This is what kings would wear, and also of priestly attire, what priests would wear. Later on, at the end of the book in chapter 19, it describes Jesus in his return with a robe dipped in blood. And I used to think that was a reference to his sacrificial blood shed upon the cross. And then a little more research and thinking into it, and it's as if a king is walking through a field of battle and all of his vanquished clothes are lying there, and the blood of his vanquished clothes would attach itself to the, the hems and bottoms of his garment. It's talking about Jesus in his kingly conquering victory, this long robe. It says he has a golden sash around his chest. This speaks of his high priestly status. As priest, Jesus represents us and opens the way for us so that we are a kingdom of priests to serve our God. And we don't have to go to a priest, but in Jesus' name, we go directly to the throne of grace to present our prayers, to confess our sins, to claim forgiveness a golden sash around his chest. The picture of Jesus continues in verse 14. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. This reminds us of the description of the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7 and verse 9. You know, in John 17, Jesus prayed to be glorified with the Father, with the glory that he had. And in this description, we see that God the Father answered our prayer. Jesus has been glorified. Jesus is glorified with the Ancient of Days. Hairs of head, white like wool, like snow. It speaks of wisdom, divinity, eternity. He has eyes like a flame of fire. Eyes like a flame of fire. What do you think that means? What do you think that's symbolic for? 
He has piercing eyes. I think it's more than just somebody with a, a piercing gaze, though I imagine Jesus must have a very piercing gaze. I think it means, in fact, I'm confident that it means, he sees right through us. There's no facade with Jesus. You know what a facade is? It's sort of a fake appearance that we put up. The old Western movies, the old John Wayne movies, you know, it looked like he was downtown on Main Street having a gunfight, and these big buildings were there, but they're just facades, right? There's nothing behind them, just little poles that are holding up the outward facade of the building. It's all fake. None of it's real. Many of us live the Christian life just like that. It's all a big facade. It's fake. It's propped up, but if somebody were to remove the props, we'd come crashing down and everybody would see us for what we are. Well, guess what? You might fool everybody else, but there's no fooling Jesus. He's got eyes like blazing fire. He sees right through the fakeness, right through the facade, through phony righteousness. His feet, like burnished bronze, are refined in a furnace. His feet, like burnished bronze. And some make a mistake here to think of this almost as if we're drawing a, a physical picture of Jesus. And we're talking now about skin color. No, burnished bronze is talking about trampling his enemies. His feet with burnished bronze refined in a furnace. It's, does anybody remember what brass knuckles are? I never used them. I, but I, I grew up hearing about them. And I remember one time somebody brought one to school. They got in a lot of trouble because they, they brought that to school. More forgiveness back then for that kind of mistake. But uh, So I remember seeing this pair of brass knuckles. And uh, it, it was meant to execute punishment on one's enemies. So feet like burnished bronze refined in a furnace talk about trampling and crushing evil in his judgment. This is a victorious, conquering king, Jesus. It continues about his voice. His voice was like the roar of many waters, sounding like what we read about in Ezekiel chapter 1, like the sound of the Almighty. Again, Jesus prayed to be glorified with the Father, and we see again that God the Father answered his prayer. The text continues in verse 16. In his right hand he held seven stars. Now, what are these seven stars? I love it when Revelation interprets itself and tells us what things mean. In verse 20, we are told conclusively that the seven stars and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the churches. Now, we have another important decision to make here. Let me just see by a, a show of hands, if you've studied Revelation before, if you haven't, you can keep your hands down. But do you think when we talk about the angels, or another word is messenger, to the seven churches, are we A, talking about angelic spiritual beings, or B, talking about earthly overseers or pastors who are messengers to the church? How many of you think A, angelic spiritual beings? How many of you think earthly human overseers of the church. All right, a couple of good options there, and people fall on, on both sides of the uh, equation and how we respond to that. In the Moody Bible commentary, Daniel Green makes a few good points as to why he believes that we're talking here about pastors or overseers of local churches. He says, number one, uh, these are human leaders who are held in God's hand. He says they're responsible for a spiritual oversight of the local church. Now, I believe that God has ministering spirits, and there may be angels as ministering spirits who are watching over Montrose right now. We plen had plenty of uh, seeming attacks this morning from air conditioning going out to uh, I got up here and suddenly felt faint as soon as I opened God's word all of these kinds of things. Uh, so I, there's a battle going on all around us, right? I feel better now about it. There, there's a battle going on all around us that we don't witness, but sometimes it comes to the fore, especially when we're sharing the good news of Jesus with the lost or when we're opening up 
God's word, and when we're talking about Jesus. So, responsible for spiritual oversight of the local church. I don't think angels have that responsibility. I don't think spiritual beings answer to God for their oversight of the local church. Also, it's unlikely that God would use a human agent in John to communicate with heavenly beings. And finally, it could be that these seven stars are meant to be contradictory to the seven stars of Emperor Domitian's imperial cult. So the coinage of that day, Domitian's coinage, had seven stars which appeared upon it, sort of his symbol. And perhaps here the churches are proclaimed to be, and the messengers of the churches proclaimed to be in opposition to Emperor Domitian and the imperial cult. So I would kind of lean towards the, the angels or messengers of the seven churches being human pastors, overseers, those that Jesus has given responsibility to be under shepherds of his church, and they will answer to him. I will answer to Jesus for my shepherding of the flock here at Montrose. That makes it pretty serious, right? No wonder James says not many of you should presume to be teachers because there's a big responsibility when you do so. The text continues now. So we've got the seven stars. From his mouth came what? What's coming out of Jesus' mouth here in the vision? A sharp, two-edged sword. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from his sight. All are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So this is the Word of God, a sharp two-edged sword, the two-edged sword coming out of Jesus' mouth, he speaks the word of God, not only proclaiming to us the will of God, but it's the word of God to which we are accountable, in which we will be given, we will be giving an account one day. The text continues. It says his face was like the sun shining in full strength, glory, radiance, heavenly exaltation. Chapter 22 says that there's no need for the sun in the New Jerusalem, the sun in the sky. Why is that? The Lord himself will be the light. So Jesus is radiant like the sun, shining in full strength. So we have this introduction to Jesus. And how does John respond? When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. You know, sometimes people will say, oh, I wish Jesus would show up in our church this morning. Well, he is here by his spirit. He's promised that when we are gathered together in his name, here he is with us. So he is here. And I hope you're honoring him right now by being engaged in the study of his word and not only understanding it, but by seeking to ask God how this works out in my life, how this works in our life together. So he is here with us. But if Jesus were to appear in all this heavenly glory, if we had this kind of a vision, you're not going to be going up to Jesus and giving him a COVID fist bump. <laughs> You're not going to be going up to Jesus and, you know, slapping him on the back. Hey there, buddy, it's good to finally meet you face to face. John, John spent years with Jesus in his earthly ministry. But upon seeing this vision of Jesus and his resurrection glory, his exaltation reign, what does John do? I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, and he said, Fear not, I am the first and the last. He's eternal, he's divine, he's over, he's above all. He's the uncaused cause. Everything in our universe has a cause and effect, right? We know it, we see it, that's the life that we live. But somewhere at the very beginning, there must be an uncaused cause who is the result of it all. And Jesus is the first and the last. He's the Alpha. He's the Omega. He is the living one. He is the I am. I am the living one. 
He said, I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. He's the sufficient Savior. He's the risen Lord. He says, I have the keys of death and Hades. Huh, wait a minute. I thought Satan was in charge of Hades and hell. No. No. Satan's not in charge. Jesus is in charge. Well, I don't like that Jesus. Well, okay, you can make up your own Jesus, but if you want to worship the Jesus of the Bible, then we come to the revelation of Jesus Christ, and we humble ourselves, and we say, Jesus, this is who you are, because this is how you reveal yourself to be. So Jesus is the one who holds the keys of death and Hades. He's sovereign over our eternal destiny. How you respond to Jesus determines where, where you will spend eternity. So all who received him, you get the right to become children of God. Hell canceled, heaven guaranteed. But to those who rejected him, condemnation, separation, forever and ever. In a horrible, terrible place so bad that Jesus calls it hell. And we read in the final chapters of Revelation that anyone whose name is not found written in the last book of life will be cast with an incorruptible resurrection body into the lake of fire. Where the worm never dies, the fire never goes out, Gehenna, hell. Jesus is sovereign over our eternal destiny. Jesus holds the key. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We live in a world today that says, you hold the key. I hold the key to my destiny. I make my future. I determine my destiny. That's not what scripture teaches. It's not. Jesus says, I hold the key. I hold the key. And finally, we have a brief introduction here to the revelation itself. Verse 19, Jesus says, Right therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. The things that you have seen, John is doing that right now. He's writing of this description of Jesus. The, the things that are, that's a description of Revelation 2 and 3 primarily. As Jesus writes to the churches. And through these seven churches, he's writing down through the ages to Montrose Baptist Church and to every other local church. And he's describing the things that we need to repent of, the things that we can be commended for, what the consequences are, and what the promises will be for those who are faithful and who conquer. So write the things that are and the things that shall take place after this. And that comprises all of chapter 4 all the way into chapter 22. The description of what is going to take place next. Revelation is primarily a book about the future. But it's a book that applies to our lives today. And so as we study what God has for us in the future, we need to constantly be asking ourselves, Lord, how does this make a difference in how I live my life today? How I persevere, how I endure, how I think how I relate to the world around me. How does this make a difference in my life today? So the things that are, the things that shall take place after this. And then again, verse 20, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels, the messengers of the seven churches. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. Never forget that Revelation was written to local Churches, And so as I preach it and proclaim it, I will do so with that in mind, that Jesus is speaking to us as a local church. And what does he want us to know? That is the question that we're presented with. This book is a book that predicts the future. It's a book that promises blessing to those who hear it, heed it, obey it, even to those who read it out loud. It betrays the person of Jesus Christ. And it ought to, in our lives, generate a response. What is that response? Worship. When we see Jesus, reverence, awe, 
John the Apostle falls down at his feet as though dead. Do we truly reverence Jesus? Do we hold him in that kind of awe? Will we humble ourselves before the Lord of the universe, the King of kings and Lord of lords? I wonder how have you personally responded to the Jesus of this book? How have you responded to the Jesus of this book? Do you receive him and the life that he gives? Or have you rejected him? If you're in a place of rejecting Jesus, I would urge you to turn from your sins and trust in Jesus. Simply say, Lord, I admit that I am a sinner. I know that I've done terrible things. I've told lies, that makes me a liar. I've blasphemed your name, that makes me a blasphemer. I've stolen, that makes me a thief. I have had hatred in my heart for someone. Jesus, you said that makes me a murderer. And I know you'll never let me into your kingdom in my own righteousness. So Jesus, I turn from my sin and I trust in you. I believe that you died on the cross, Jesus. I believe that you rose from the dead on the third day, Lord Jesus. And Jesus, I simply come right now in all honesty and I cry out to you, save me. Save me, Lord Jesus. And if that's you today, if you're crying out to Jesus to save you from your sins, Jesus promises in his word that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. And if you are among those who has called upon Jesus, I urge you, I urge you, don't let our culture define Jesus for you. Come to his word. Rely on the ministry of the Holy Spirit as Jesus reveals himself crystal clear to you for who he is and what he wants for you. Submit yourselves to him. Humble yourselves before him. Let's pray together. Gracious Father in heaven, I thank you for your word to us today as we have this incredible vision that you gave to John that he wrote down on paper that was passed through the centuries so that we could read it. And as we read it, your spirit illumines our minds and our understanding to get a bigger picture of Jesus and who he is. We thank you that we serve an incredible Savior, a risen Lord, King of kings and Lord of lords. One day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, to your glory, God, our Father. We give you thanks as we pray together in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 At this time,